Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to see you all here, uh, to see such a crowd uh, as we launch um, our conference on conflict, trauma and memorialisation. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Olwen Perdue. I'm Professor of Social History here at Queen's University. Um, I'm also Director of the Centre for Public History, and it's in that capacity that I'm here to welcome you tonight to this our uh, conference co-hosted with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, the Centre for Public History at Queen's has been running now for just over six years. Um, in that time, uh, it has developed considerable reputation for research strengths in a number of areas. Um, based as we are in Northern Ireland, it'll come as no surprise to many of you that one of our areas of expertise is in dealing with difficult or contested pasts. Um, we work closely with local community groups uh, across Northern Ireland and with a range of, of cultural institutions from the small local focus to the big national ones. Um, and working with them, we seek to understand how the past is used in divided societies and also how we can better engage uh, people with their past and with that of others, just address some of the issues that affect conflict affected societies or divided societies and that idea of division covers um, as we're all too aware very many different contexts and different meanings um, and in that sense one of the ways that we're seeking to work um, and have been working is also to collaborate internationally and um, to put what we know about here into a wider global context because every context as we've discovered over the last few days those of us who have been in a room together for three days um, every context is different and while there are overlaps and similarities it, there are also many many differences um, and it's because of that 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 interest and collaboration and the international focus that we have that we're particularly delighted to be working with the the u.s holocaust museum i was delighted when i met with with robert um, Ehrenreich, director of national academic programs at the museum just before COVID put the world on hold. Um, and the one thing that's been common over the last week is everyone saying, yeah, it was about three years ago. No way, it was five years ago. <laughs> so there was that hiatus in everybody's lives that we all understand. Um, but before that, we, we came together, we got chatting, and, and the idea emerged of collaborating on an event that examined memory and memorialization in, in a range of contexts. And from those early conversations, the idea for this conference arose, and we came up with the idea of examining this theme from a number of different contexts, uh, particularly the history of the Holocaust, of slavery, of institutional abuse, and the Northern Ireland conflict. And once we had a theme, Robert and I had great fun putting together a wish list of the speakers that we wish to have. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that, that pretty much all the people that were top of our list have actually come here. And um, you'll be hearing from them tomorrow and this evening. Um, and it has been a great pleasure over the last few days as the speakers at this conference workshopped their papers and workshop the ideas together to listen to the ideas and perspectives and research projects of scholars and practitioners who really are leading in the field. Um, the papers you will hear this evening and tomorrow um, have been workshopped closely. Um, a lot of thought has gone into them and I think even over the course of this week perhaps ideas have been evolving. So I'd like to thank publicly all the participants at this point uh, for their thoughtful and insightful contributions to the discussions. I'm particularly delighted that uh, Professor Susan Nyman, uh, Director of the Einstein Forum, agreed to give a uh, car voice a week of her incredibly busy schedule. And I must say, right, I take my hat off to you, Susan. It's, it's amazing that you're here uh, to give tonight's keynote lecture and to fully participate in, in the workshops all week. And I just want to say a huge thank you, Susan, personally, for the rich insights that you've added to the discussions. And finally, to thank um, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum for working with us on the project, for all your ideas, your enthusiasm, the support. And we do very much look forward to building on this collaboration in the years that lie ahead, Robert. So I'd like to now hand over to my collaborator, collaborator, co-conspirator, uh, Dr. Robert Ehrenreich, who will say a few words and formally introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Robert. Good evening. Um, I really can't express um, what a privilege it is to be here today. 
at Queen's University Belfast and to participate in what has been already three incredibly um, stimulating days of discussion and what will continue tonight and also tomorrow. Uh, my colleagues and I at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum are pleased to have this opportunity to co-organize and co-sponsor this workshop. Um, the museum is America's national institution for the documentation, study, and interpretation of Holocaust history and serves as the country's principal memorial to the millions of people who died during the Holocaust. As a living memorial to the Holocaust, the museum also inspires citizens and leaders um, worldwide to confront hatred, prevent genocide, and promote human dignity. The Mandel Center is specifically focused on maintaining the vibrancy and vitality of research and teaching about the Holocaust by promoting the growth of Holocaust studies as well as its integration with other fields to discover new insights and perspectives on difficult histories, fostering relationships between American and international scholars, and ensuring the training of future generations of Holocaust researchers and scholars. And I think you'll see this integration and, uh, and multidisciplinary approach over the next two days because we have an incredible um, number of people coming out of this from a completely different perspectives. And I think it's really going to enrich our understanding of the three areas. I'd like to thank the Center for Public History for hosting this event and Queen's University for co-sponsoring and co-supporting it. Thanks also to the administrative staff in the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics, as well as the Mandel Center for all the support they provided. And they were incredible over the last three days. Um, but really, there isn't a nation in the world that shouldn't be grappling with the question of how to deal with the memory and material culture of a difficult or traumatic past. The questions range from literally the monumental, um, such as what past events should or should not be represented in public spaces and how, to the particular, such as what objects should or should not be collected and exhibited. Each decision necessarily privileges one voice or perspective while marginalizing or worse yet, silencing another, since the victims cannot tell their stories and the survivors whose traumas are not acknowledged or recognized can never be truly heard. But there is hope. As Kathy Carruth once said, in a catastrophic age, trauma itself may provide the very link between cultures, not as a simple understanding of the past of others, but rather within the traumas of contemporary history as our ability to listen through the departures we have all taken from ourselves. Thus, the big questions and the focus of this program, which Professor Purdue and I first broached in 2018, which seems like a, a lifetime ago, are how we as a society decide what to collect and how to properly relate and represent difficult or traumatic pasts, focusing on three case studies. As she said, the Holocaust, the legacies of race and slavery in the United States, and the Northern Ireland conflict euphemistically known as the Troubles. Over tonight and tomorrow, you'll hear leading European and North American historians and practitioners reflect on the representation of these histories in museums, archives, oral history collections, and public space. Our ultimate hope is that everyone will listen to each other, and more importantly, to truly hear one another's voice in order to shed new light on the history and the effects of difficult histories illuminate the similarities involved amongst the people involved, forge new connections among disciplines, and nurture a cooperative discussion of these difficult issues. It's now my pleasure to introduce Susan Nyman. Uh, Dr. Nyman is an American philosopher and writer. She has written extensively on the Enlightenment, moral philosophy, metaphysics, and politics. Her work shows that philosophy is a living force for contemporary thinking and action. Born and raised, raised in Atlanta, Georgia during the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. Nyman dropped out of high school to join American activists working for peace and justice. Later, she studied philosophy at Harvard University, earning her PhD in 1986. In the 80s, she then spent six years in Berlin studying at the Free University and working as a freelance writer. She was professor of philosophy at Yale and Tel, Tel Aviv University. And in 2000, she assumed her current position as director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam. Dr. Nyman has been a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, 
a fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation Study Center in Bellagio, and I'm very jealous of that. It's a wonderful facility. <laughs> I was there once. <laughs> and a senior fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies. She's now a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. She's the author of nine books, translated into 15 languages, which have won prizes from, among others, the Association of American Publishers and the American Academy of Religion, and has shorter pieces um, that have appeared in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, The Globe and Mail, The Guardian, Die Zeit, Der Spiegel, and the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, among other publications. Tonight, she is gonna to talk to us about how not to remember the past. Um, before I hand over the um, podium, I would please ask you to turn off all noise-making devices um, because it's embarrassing for everybody. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Nyman. Thank you, Robert. Um, I know it's customary to begin a talk at a conference by um, thanking people. Um, at German events, you can sometimes see a row of five different people thanking each other. Um, but I want to give an uncustomarily warm thank you to um, Owen and Robert and Becky and Asher and whoever else contributed to putting together this conference. Um, I usually counted a win. I go to a lot of conferences and I run even more. And I usually count it a win if I meet one person whose work surprises and interests me and I'd like to see again. Well, this time, uh, your wish list you know, included um, quite a number of people who I was surprised and delighted to meet. And yes, June is always a busy time in my schedule, but I'm really glad that I came. Um, I'm going to start by reading the first paragraph of my last book, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil, because it's presumably why I was invited here. Quote, quote myself, um, I began life as a white girl in the segregated South, and I'm likely to end it as a Jewish woman in Berlin. Lest you suppose I'm tracing an arc that strides the space from perpetrator to victim, let me complicate the story. The question of whether Jews should count as white people was not quite settled in the South where I was born. There's an old saying, Reverend Wheeler Parker, who was Emmett Till's cousin, told me, if I was Catholic and lived in the South, I'd be worried. If I was Jewish, I'd be packing up. If I was black, I'd be gone." End quote, Wheeler Parker. I interviewed in uh, Greenwood, Mississippi. Now, all that is still true. Inspired by the baby steps towards historical reckoning that America had taken since Barack Obama's eulogy following the 2015 Charleston massacre, I was convinced that my country could learn something from the historical reckoning which Germany has undertaken since World War II. As a Jew who's lived and worked in Berlin for a decade, I'd experienced the early attitudes of many West Germans who saw themselves as the, world's, as the war's worst victims. Attitudes that recalled those of the defenders of the Confederate lost cause. I had followed the tortuous process by which most of them slowly came to see themselves as perpetrators and to make that knowledge the basis of a new German identity. Never did I think the German transformation was perfect, but as, to say the least, but as the first country in the world to make its historical crime central to its national narrative, I believed it had lessons for what others, particularly Americans, might do. Surely a country still debating whether to move statues of treasonous Confederate generals could look towards a country dotted with monuments to victims of its own murderous past. I should add that the original plan for this book was to discuss historical trauma and memory in three countries. In addition to Germany and the US, I planned to talk about Ireland. Since 2008, I've been coming mostly to County Kerry for a good month or two, at least once a year, and I know a little bit about Irish history and literature. So in the summer of 2016, as I still thought the book would have three parts, I duly went to just about every commemoration of the Easter Rising I could find in the Republic. 
between the fact that my editor was complaining that the manuscript was already too long and the fact that it was dawning on me how very much more research I'd have to do to do justice to the last hundred years of Irish history, uh, I gave up that plan. So though I don't plan to write about, uh, I was very happy to accept this invitation in order to continue to learn about this mad, wonderful country, whether it's one or two countries, I leave it to those of you who live here to decide. But it wasn't my fairly limited knowledge of Irish history which made it hard for me to write a talk for this conference, but a much more general set of problems. In the last couple of years, I've been haunted by a quote often used by my late friend, the great historian, Tony Judd. Um, he attributes it to Keynes, but apparently his widow told me it's actually, she, they looked very hard, it's not Keynes. But whoever said it, said something important. When the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? German facts have changed so considerably in the past two years <clears throat> that the greatest lesson others should take from Germans today may be a warning, namely, too much focus on the past can lead to blindness in the present. But much has changed in America as well as in other parts of Europe. It's jarring, though in some ways welcome, to hear American undergraduates <clears throat> talk about historical reckoning as if there were a long consensus, at least on the liberal left, about its importance. When I date that consensus from beginning with President Obama's eulogy in 2015, I guess between 2015 and 2023, an undergraduate might have been, I don't know, 10 years old when it began. That was the first time a major figure, much less a president, had publicly called for a re-examination of our past in the name of a decent future. Britain was considerably later in examining its own historical crimes. A Guardian poll taken not three months before George Floyd's murder showed that only 19% of Britons felt any shame or regret about the empire. Uh, I don't think they've redone, redone the poll, but three years later, the Guardian itself, not to mention a host of other British institutions, have made sure that at least some of the sins of empire are part of common knowledge. The events of the past three years and a host of assumptions have changed to make me certain I would not publish a book that's been pretty successful and translated into a number of languages in its current form. So it's jarring, to say the least, and because the facts in both countries keep changing so quickly, uh, my own reflections are very much in flux. Now, one might conclude that philosophers would be safer, safer if they stuck to eternal truths, or at least abstract ones. It would certainly prevent them from having to revise things they wrote a few years earlier. But it's not a conclusion I draw. <clears throat> like my own models, the philosophers of the Enlightenment I believe that philosophy is neither a specialist nor an abstract subject, but one that should engage with the controversial questions of its day. Even Immanuel Kant, the least accessible of Enlightenment writers, wrote 15 quite readable essays for the Berlinische Monatschrift, which you could view as the New York Review of his day. So what I can offer you tonight are not set in stone and not even yet publishable. I've been trying to put together a publishable essay, in fact, for the New York Review in English, um, but the facts keep changing. But here are some time-bound, hopefully timely reflections on the state of historical reckoning in two and a half countries I've been closely observing for 40 years. I know some people here have read that book, but I don't expect it of all of you. So let me begin by summarize, summarizing the main points of learning from the Germans that I still think are right. America likes to call itself exceptional, and it is exceptional in many ways. Unlike most nations which arose when some tribe or another stopped wandering and settled down in one piece of earth or another, America began as a project and, and a fanfare of ideals. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, that fanfare could have made us proud had those ideals been realized. That the Founding Fathers ignored the fact that Native Americans had a right to life and African Americans to liberty 
could serve as a reason for permanent shame, but for the fact that many have struggled to bring America's reality closer to its ideals. But America is hardly unique in preferring a historic, uh, heroic version of its history. It's completely natural that nations tell themselves and their children stories that lift up the best parts of their histories. England's Magna Carta, the Battle of Britain, France's Declaration of Human Rights, China's 5,000-year-old culture, those are stories that gladden people's hearts and lift, knit them into nationhood. When it's impossible to valorize failure, nations often turn to a narrative of victimhood, which suggests that our ancestors would have been heroes if history hadn't run roughshod over their efforts. There are nations that do both. Uh, Israel and Poland certainly seesaw between heroic and victim narratives of their national stories, and I suspect Ireland does the same. I'm a philosopher, not a historian, though I read a lot of history, but what interests me most is not the work of professional historians, though I'm glad they do their work, but public memory, what every half-educated member of a culture knows in her veins, for it seeped into them before she can remember. Things like your country's geography. Few Americans have to pause to consider whether Indiana is north of Mississippi, as no Irish person needs to wonder if Bantry Bay is south of Derry. If you've forgotten everything from your school days, you're likely to remember that. <clears throat> Unless you've lived a very long time in Germany, you'll be surprised to know that for a good four decades after it ended, most West Germans really thought they were the worst victims of World War II. While there's rich scholarship about the Nazi period produced by historians in the US uh, and Britain, in American life, the symbolic importance of the Nazis stands in inverse relation to common knowledge about them. I leave um, aside, of course, some of the experts that have been in this workshop and who know a great deal, but I'm talking about public memory. Nazi just means, for Americans and Brits and quite a few other people, the black hole at the heart of history, the apex of evil, the sin for which no condemnation is sufficient, no expiation possible. Once when I was doing research in Mississippi, I explained to a group that the first generation of post war Germans uh, sounded much like defenders of the lost cause, and one gentleman replied with surprise, but surely they know at the latest when they open the camps that what they'd done was pure evil. I'm not going to try to do a Mississippi accent here. But as a matter of fact, they did not. They were thinking of things more immediate. Their cities had been left in ruins and ashes, seven million of their citizens dead, while many more languished in POW camps. Their territory was dismembered, food was so scarce that Berliners lived on dandelion greens to supplement the sack of potatoes they could sometimes get on the black market in exchange for a set of china. The winter of 1946 was so cold that the tall trees that lined the most famous boulevard in the city were cut down for fuel. The loss of the war was a deep blow to a generation trained to be heroes, and on top of it all, the occupiers of the two nations they most detested, the subhuman Russians and the vulgar Yankees, were blaming them for starting the war. The Germans, indeed, had suffered in defeat, just like the supporters of the Confederacy 80 years earlier, and their own sense of victimhood was first in their minds. Germany was the first nation to overcome the vacillation, you may call it a dialectic, between hero and victim and introduce a further category, namely the perpetrator. Now, it's easy to say that Germany took that step for good reasons. The inherent atrocity of its crimes cried out for atonement. The world's condemnation left it little choice. But hardly any Germans saw it that way at the time. The atrocities, many argued, were no graver than Stalin's, who killed more people more quickly and earlier than did Hitler's armies. Or Truman's, whose atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki not only killed thousands of civilians in a flash, 
but opened the distinct possibility of total annihilation on a scale the Nazis never attained. As for the world's judgment, they really didn't care. Hadn't most of the world condemned Germany just two decades earlier for a deadly world war in which all of Europe's colonial powers were to blame? You may view such sentiments as the dishonest, self-serving apologetics they are. Yet if you want to understand not only Germany, but the ways in which all countries approach those parts of their histories they'd rather forget, you should know that these sentiments were felt as keenly as any other. This is how nations avoid responsibility. Germany was able to overcome that very natural defensive self-delusion, a historical achievement few other nations have come close to matching. The German people's work to acknowledge the evils their nation committed was extremely slow, reluctant, and fitful. But slowly, reluctantly, and fitfully, they did begin to acknowledge it. In the East, that acknowledgement was furthered by the leadership, most of whom had been in exile or in con uh, concentration camps and were genuine anti-fascists. And the repression of their story led to a flaw in German historical reckoning that's so grave it's infected many of the others. German memory culture, as it's called, applies only to West Germany. East Germans remember the post-war historical reckoning completely differently than do West Germans. And if West Germans speak of it at all, it's only to spit out the words verordnete antifascismus, that is anti-fascism, ordered from above. I discuss uh, East German anti-fascism in a long chapter of my book, for I've never been able to understand the accusation. Was it right that a people who spent 12 years surrounded by fascist propaganda have anti-fascism ordered from above? And don't decent West Germans criticize the Adenauer era, the first two decades after the war, precisely because it did not promote anti-fascism, just a reign of silence, which allowed former Nazis to return to prominent and powerful positions, as long as they foreswore one pillar of Nazism, anti-Semitism, at least in public, while loudly proclaiming the other, what one German historian has called verordnete anti-communismus, anti-communism, ordained from above. Now, East Germany's anti-fascism was abused, as state ideologies usually are, in order to obscure its own form of tyranny. I've dealt with these and other objections in my book, so I won't argue them here, but for those tempted to respond by pointing out the real flaws of the German Democratic Republic, I would summarize my response this way. Until 1985, there was only one German state that would agree to the proposition the Nazis were criminals and their defeat was a liberation. And that simple proposition was only uttered in uh, East, not in West Germany. But there's a reason for remembering East German anti-fascism that's important for contemporary debates and not just a matter of historical justice. The uh, East German understanding fascism of, the East German understanding of fascism was not Judeo-centric. As I said in the beginning, I am Jewish, but I adhere to the universalist tradition of Judaism. The East German uh, state, not only commemorated the death of six million Jews, but of 27 million people, civilian and military, murdered in the Soviet Union. It also paid attention to the crimes of colonialism. In other words, though the GDR's reckoning with Nazi history had so many flaws of its own that I wouldn't recommend taking it up wholesale, it also had elements that are missing in the historical uh, reckoning of what's now the Federal Republic. It did not reduce Nazi crimes to anti-Semitism, but treated anti-Semitism as a particularly virulent form of racism. As a universalist Jew, I don't find this offensive, much less anti-Semitic. The Federal Republic's reduction of Nazism to anti-Semitism has led to a set of problems that I'll discuss in a moment. The situation was different in the larger West Germany, where most former Nazis were soon allowed back 
into their positions in government, industry, and universities. There it took decades of grassroots action on the part of uh, church groups, artists, intellectuals, and students to face up to Nazi crimes. Um, when I arrived in West Berlin in 1982, I was stunned by the array of activities falling under the name of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, what Americans, and I think other English speakers now call historical reckoning. One can argue about the dates, but I'd argue that serious historical reckoning began in West Germany in the early 1980s, gaining steam, at least in Berlin, with the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Nazi takeover in 1933. Once again, none of this work was initiated or supported by the center-right government. The Christian Democratic Party has yet to acknowledge how many old Nazis it kept in power. Historical reckoning was a matter of local efforts, like the work of hundreds of volunteers who dug up the former Gestapo torture chambers, which is a state monument today. At the time, members of my generation told me history education in school simply ended in 1933 when the Nazis came to power. Feelings after the war were raw. Too many teachers still mourned the end of the Third Reich. But all the grassroots efforts, led by those who were angry at how little they'd been taught about their teachers' crimes, forced a change in official public opinion. It was symbolized in 1985 by West Germany's President Richard von Weizsäcker. On the 40th anniversary of the war's end, he announced roughly that while Germans had suffered terribly, other people had suffered more, and their suffering was Germany's fault. I um, exaggerate only slightly. That's what the long speech was about. And at the time, uh, as an outsider, I couldn't understand what all the fuss about Weizsäcker's speech was about, I found those claims about as banal as the claim that the earth is round. I didn't know enough at the time, in 1985, to realize it was a revolutionary moment in the telling of history. While every nation before did its best to offer a heroic narrative of its history, sweeping the messy parts under the carpet, or failing that, asserting its own victimhood, the Germans were the first nation to acknowledge the worst. We were pe perpetrators of evil. Facing Germany's criminal past was not an academic exercise. It was too intimate for that. It meant confronting their parents and teachers and calling their authority rotten. It took decades of struggle, often intergenerational struggle, struggle to force changes in notions of citizenship, governmental policies, educational systems, and physical iconography. The struggle was often personally wrenching because the insistence on facing one's parents' crimes seemed to conflict with the duty to respect your parents simply in virtue of their being your parents. Cultures differ widely in their views of the scope of that duty, but all presuppose some respect for your parents simply because parenting at its most basic keeping small, helpless creatures alive until they can live on their own is bloody hard work, as anybody who's tried it will know. It would be even harder without the presumption that respect and gratitude are owed to the person or persons who do that work. In extreme cases of abuse, think of incest or hard violence, parents may forfeit their right to be respected. So extreme cases, so what if your parents were Nazis? <clears throat> and this was the dilemma faced by most thoughtful Germans of my generation, give or take a decade. Note I said thoughtful. Contrary to popular misperceptions of the Nazis as illiterate thugs, the highest proportion of party members had university degrees. Dates mattered, as did exact biographies, those whose father Fathers were drafted, but served as medical orderlies, had the easiest time of it. Some, like the son of Hans Frank, the high Nazi official who governed most of German-occupied Poland, has written of privately celebrating the date of his father's execution. But even those whose parents were far less culpable felt and feel to this day contaminated by their parents' or their grandparents' sins. Only those who truly resisted Nazi crimes were not complicit in them, and most of those who truly resisted were dead. 
its significance that many West Germans of that generation chose not to have children themselves, largely because their notions of family and authority, respect and responsibility had become so conflicted. Now, when I began in 2015, inspired by President Obama's eulogy to work on learning from the Germans, America had barely begun to acknowledge its own national crimes. And today we are a nation deeply torn. On the one side, we have those who, in the words of the Florida legislator, Lature want to prohibit the teaching of, quote, anything that makes an individual feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race. One could say snowflake, but OK. <laughs> on the other hand, we have some who are unable to find anything in American history but a list of crimes and misfortunes. And I'll talk about those at the end of this lecture. Now, it's hard to find anyone in the South or the North today who would argue in favor of slavery, but it's only very recently that many of us learned about what happened after slavery. Outright slavery was forbidden by new amendments to the Constitution, but Southern states found ways to create institutions that were in some ways worse than slavery. Laws were enacted to make it illegal for black people to talk loudly near a white woman, walk next to a railroad track, sell produce after dark, or be unemployed by a white person. Anyone found guilty of these and similar offenses could be sentenced to hard labor under the convict leasing system in which state prisoners were rented to plantations, mines, and factories. This was often worse than slavery because under chattel slavery, the slave owner had an economic interest in preserving his investment. Having paid, let's say, $1,000 for a human being, slaveholders took care, usually, to maintain minimal standards of health care and nourishment. A company leasing convicts, by contrast, had an unlimited supply of cheap labor that could always be replaced so thousands of prisoners were simply worked to death. In some places, the mortality was 40%. Not until the US entered World War II was convict leasing entirely outlawed because the Japanese used it as propaganda to encourage people of color to oppose the US war effort. Interesting fun fact. There are several reasons for American slowness in facing our history. And one is fairly simple. There's a 100-year hole in it. And few white and even many black Americans are aware of that. Um, I uh, met a really excellent um, black reporter, Michelle Norris, uh, who told me memorably her parents didn't tell them how bad things were because they didn't want to send them out in the world with rocks in their pockets. I get it. For most of us, the period between the Emancipation Proclamation and the Montgomery bus boycott is a vague and cloudy blur. My own ignorance was enormous before I began the research that led to that last book. There are sinister explanations for the presence of this hole in American memory, beginning with the concerted efforts of the defenders of the lost cause. But one explanation is perfectly innocent. Americans like narratives of progress call them happy endings. Our stories are aspirational, not actual. We may acknowledge that wrongs were committed in the past, but we want to believe they were righted in a roughly straight line. The more we learn that progress has often faltered, the more we feel shame. And who wants that? Yet sometimes shame is the first step to healing, for you cannot heal a broken past until you're honest about it. It's an old American custom, after all. Who didn't learn that our first president refused to tell a lie about cutting down a cherry tree? Now, no historian ever confirmed that myth. <laughs> but no matter, it enshrined the idea that telling the truth about what you'd done wrong is the bedrock of further decency. In the German case, telling the truth about the Nazis was a necessary step towards creating a far more decent, strong, and even happier country. At least I would have said that um, until about a year, no, three years ago. Um, let's see that I'm, let's see. Here's one 
very deep assumption across every country I know anything about, evil is what other people do. Even those who subscribe to the doctrine of original sin in the abstract tend to ignore it when things get particular and believe that they and their tribe may make mistakes, but nothing that merits a word like evil. The impulse is just as strong towards evil's past as evil's present. We want our ancestors to be honorable and honored. My grandfather died for the homeland he loved. What's criminal about that? My great uncle was just defending his home. Now, I know that there are plenty of people on both sides of the conflict here who've said those words and more, but um, you might be surprised to learn that the descendants of the Confederate Army who fought and fell in order to preserve slavery said just the same things. And the German Wehrmacht made exactly the same claims as the descendants of the Confederate Army not only in the dark shell-shocked days following the uncon unconditional surrender outside Berlin in 1945, such remarks continued to be made in public through the end of the 20th century when the Wehrmacht exhibit broke West Germany's last taboo. The Hamburg Institute, which organized the exhibit, never expected the reactions it provoked to cl the claim that the Wehrmacht systematically committed war crimes seem to foreign observers and even most German historians about as controversial as the claim that water is wet. But the gap between historical scholarship and ordinary public memory proved tremendous. Every German had a father, a son, a husband, or a brother who served in the Wehrmacht if they didn't serve themselves. And the reactions to the exhibit showed how many still believed the myth that the Wehrmacht was clean, as I said, or even knightly, galant. As the exhibit was shown over four years around the country, thousands of people demonstrated to protest it, often with signs like, Grandpa was a hero. In one place, the exhibit was firebombed. Now, the knowledge that it took decades of hard work before those who committed what are often seen as the greatest crimes in history could not acknowledge those crimes at all can bring enormous relief to those still working towards similar acknowledgement in other countries. And I suppose that is one thing we can definitely learn from the Germans. People tend to think, if they don't know a lot about post-war history, that, as the gentleman in Mississippi said, the minute the war was over, they got down on their knees and begged the world for atonement. Not true. So the rest of us might think, should think, and even those raised in the heart of darkness uh, needed time and trouble to see the light, why shouldn't it take time and trouble to come to terms with other crimes? We all benefit from inheritance we didn't ask for and can only partially reject if we choose. Those inheritances include most crucially being born into a particular culture. Most of us are citizens without active consent we had no choice about the place where our mothers happened to give birth, and we couldn't possibly consent to it any more than we could consent to being born. Some of the most important things that determine our lives are entirely contingent in ways that can be wonderful or tragic. We may begin by understanding our debts to the past by analogy with familial inheritance, but our responsibility to our nation's past is political. To be a citizen is not merely to take responsibility for your country's history since the moment you or your ancestors claimed its citizenship. Political identity can't be merely a matter of acquiring the benefits that comes with one passport or another. Though the individuals responsible for historical crimes may be long gone, many of the corporate entities, public and private, that legalized and profited from slavery still exist. So do descendants of those who still suffer discrimination because they're part of a group that was historically marginalized or oppressed. So as long as they live in a society built on injustice, even those who have not incurred any guilt personally have some responsibility for correcting it. Now, in the past couple of years, in reasonably progressive circles, Few people need me to rehearse this argument. 
or to call for historical reckoning. I could probably make a living off of it if I accepted all the invitations asking me to do so. But rather than issue a renewed call for historical reckoning, I want to call for reason and nuance and care in doing it, even as I know those qualities are in lamentably short supply. My fear is that it's so hard to do this with reason and care and nuance that it may be better to do more forgetting and less remembering. Let me tell you a little bit about the changes in the German context, with, uh, which have very interesting parallels to others. A few months after my book Learning from the Germans was published in German, um, new developments occurred which have kept many of us who live there very busy. I praised, as you heard, the Germans for being the, pers the first nation in the world to face their forebears' crimes. I never imagined this process could go into overdrive, creating a McCarthy-like atmosphere in the process. The reasons have to do with German politics. For the first time since the war, a far-right party received enough votes to enter parliament, drawing strength from the, its anti-immigrant agenda in reaction to the welcoming of over a million immigrants, most of them uh, refugees, from the Syrian war. The government's first reaction to the success of this right-wing party, I'll call it the AfD, that's what it's called, Alternative for Deutschland, um, the government's first reaction to the ascent of this party was to appoint a federal anti-Semitism commissioner, along with one for each of the 16 German states, at least one for each of the 16 German states. I think in Berlin we're up to 10. Remember that that response depends on believing that Nazism or fascism can be reduced to anti-Semitism get rid of anti-Semitism, well, you got no problems. None of these commissioners are Jewish, and most of them are shockingly ignorant about Jews, Israel, and Palestine. And the police statistics show that 93% of all anti-Semitic hate crimes are committed by white right-wing Germans. The government has decided to put most of its efforts into, uh, into going after so-called left-wing anti-Semites, that is, those who criticize Israel's policies in the occupied territories, or simply who believe that Palestinians are human beings whose rights are being denied. Now, this actually includes a lot of uh, Jews and Israelis in Germany, including me. People have been denied prizes and funding, had concerts and lectures canceled, and in some cases fired from their jobs through guilt by association. The director of Berlin's Jewish Museum was forced to resign after a phone call Netanyahu made to the German Minister of Culture because one of his 200 employees tweeted a critical protest written by distinguished Israeli writers and artists. So left-leaning Jews have been hurt, but even more so people of color. A Palestinian German television <coughs> moderator was fired after liking a tweet by an American Jewish group critical of the occupation. A young German of Congolese origin was just fired from his job as the very successful moderator of a children's television program, the first black moderator of a television program in Germany, um, for attending a children's festival in Palestine. <clears throat> I could name a host of examples although most of them take place behind closed doors, in committees whose members have promised not to reveal confidential deliberations, so that the real number of cases is certainly higher than I know. And publicly protested. I've been part of such deliberations myself, like every member of every committee that ever meets to award jobs or prizes or funding, I'm bound to secrecy about what takes place during those discussions. There are good reasons for such discretion. <clears throat> and I try to preserve it by disguising the committee. But commitments to keeping deliberations secret allow for abuses that can never be proven. In this particular case, an eight-year-old blog entry suggesting that um, 
a person who had been awarded a substantial prize was an anti-Semite was simply enough to um, wipe him out of even of the records that he had ever been consist uh, con considered when I did a little research and suggested that actually the blog post was uh, written uh, and reposted by an organization supported by uh, Sheldon Adelson, some people know what that means, and um, <clears throat> had been criticized by the um, uh, editor-in-chief of Haaretz, suggesting that maybe one ought to weigh one's sources a little differently if one is genuinely interested in what was called due diligence rather than Googling around. I would say so the fact that the committee had never heard of Sheldon Adelson or Haaretz. Uh, I resigned from that committee in protest, um, but I'd violate the commission, the commitment to discretion if I made the name of the organization public. So I do now tell the story without mentioning the name since I'm on lots of committees. It's, it's okay. Now, um, many of the people behind these McCarthy-like proceedings call themselves anti-Deutsche. They're unwilling to acknowledge any progress in German history and spend their time arguing that everything in German history was more racist and barbarous than anything anywhere else. These views, very present in the German media, are extraordinarily provincial. One of their complaints is that Germany never faced its colonial crimes. Late to the colonizing <clears throat> game, which other great powers began, Germany did wind up committing genocide in West Africa I'm glad this has been acknowledged and that reparations have been offered. Uh, but Spain, whose colonial <clears throat> regime in South America was the world's bloodiest, has yet to begin to acknowledge that fact and angrily resists any suggestion it should. It has only just very tentatively begun to face up to its long fascist history. Nevertheless, the anti-Deutsche take pride in proclaiming that German crimes are worse than anyone else's, along with proclaiming that they've never been addressed. Ironically, it's a backhanded confirmation of my own view that Germans are extremely dedicated to facing their history. I don't know where in the world a group calling itself anti-American or anti-Belgian uh, would get so much airtime. Okay, we know. Calling yourself anti-American is political death in the United States. Best to leave that to those on the right who will use any criticism of the country to accuse the critic of being anti-American. But I hope that what I've described in the last two years in Germany, and I can say more in the question and answer period, um, I hope it will remind you of a place at least the Americans in the room know better. Since the long overdue recognition that America needs to face the dark sides of its history took hold, plenty of voices emerged to say there is nothing but dark side in American history, and this is a harmful position. Let me be clear, the right wing campaign to banish anything that might cause discomfort from American classrooms is even more dangerous. Toni Morrison, Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail, the graphic novel, Mouse, we have no idea what's coming next. Those campaigns have much more power in state legislatures and school boards, and their tools are very clever and very effective. But if those who have bad knowledge of our painful histories have more power, those who see nothing but pain in those histories are doing us no favors. On the contrary, the excesses of historical reckoning just feed the fires of those who want to do away with all of it. I strongly believe that monuments to Confederate generals or generic Johnny Rebs could be, should be taken off the streets. Uh, I think they can put in museums like memorials to Prussian generals and other offensive figures in a specially built museum in uh, Berlin. I had some discussion of that in uh, the workshop. It's uh, an open and interesting and evolving question. But when someone proposes to remove memorials to Abraham Lincoln, I start to see red. Lincoln held some positions we now consider racist. Why not rejoice in the fact that we've made some progress in the last 150 years? 
in understanding and combating racism. We made progress on the shoulders of people like Abraham Lincoln. Unlike today's Twitter critics, he risked and lost his life for supporting the amendment to give free slaves rights. Though I wasn't crazy about uh, the novel Underground Railroad, I was excited, I had been impressed with Barry Jenkins' films. So I was excited to learn that there was an Amazon television series coming out, meant to be a long overdue replacement for Gone with the Wind, the most viewed film about the American Civil War. At the moment, I'm actually glad that Jenkins' film did not have the resonance that was expected. I think the first um, episode, which contains, I think, the most horrific uh, depiction of violence I ever saw, I think it put a lot of people off of watching it further. But I'm not sorry. Um, I read every nearly every review I could find of the series, and I couldn't find one that called out his interpretation of abolitionist history, though none other than the great artist and activist Paul Robeson, whose own father escaped from slavery, affirmed the importance of white abolitionists. Jenkins' interpretation of history that only black people contributed to black liberation is much like that of Nicole Hannah-Jones, creator of the 1619 Project, whose work Jenkins praised in glowing terms. And the film, if anybody's seen that, I'd be interested in discussing it with them afterwards. There's almost a mirror image of Gone with the Wind, okay? All the black people in the film are brave, courageous, loyal, warm, strong, persevering. All the white people are one variety of uh, or another of horror. So what we found is we got Gone with the Wind, we got a mirror image of Gone with the Wind. Um, the 1619 Project has rightly served as a lightning rod for the current state of historical reckoning in America. On the one hand, the most dangerous and well-funded critics reject the project outright. Those who oppose any teaching of American, uh, American racist history have succeeded in banning the 1619 project from school systems in many states. On the other hand, those of us who demand that we teach our shameful history ought to demand that we teach it well. Hannah Jones responds defensively to every criticism of the 1619 project and believes that it's racist, in particular the claim that the American Revolution was fought to defend slavery that Britain was supposedly prepared to abolish. It's hard to find any criticisms of another tendentious claim, namely that advances toward black civil rights were made by blacks alone. Do those who might point out the truth feel too guilty to speak it? To be sure, there were never enough of us. But the fact that there were many is crucial, not just for honoring the historical record, but for any progress we might make in moving history forward. This was brought home to me by Brian Stevenson, whom I was privileged to interview while writing Learning from the German. Stevenson is the black attorney who founded the Equal Justice Initiative and created the National Lynching Museum, the most extraordinary monument I ever saw. His decision to create that monument was made after he witnessed examples of Germany's historical reckoning. And when I visited him in Montgomery, he told me, among other things, this quote, you should be proud of those white Southerners in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama who argued in the 1850s that slavery was wrong. There were white Southerners in the 1920s who tried to stop lynching, and you don't know their names. The fact that you don't know their names says everything we need to know, end quote. Stevenson thinks that commemorating those names would help turn the country from shame to pride. Quote, we could actually claim a heritage rooted in courage and defiance of doing what is easy and preferring what is right 
We can make that the norm we want to celebrate as our Southern history and heritage and culture, end quote. Thinking of that visit some years later reminds me of the anti-Deutsche, those whose narrative of German history is so unremittingly bleak that they refuse to acknowledge any progress in it. I know that progress is a contested concept, at least since Foucault, who had a genius for pointing out how examples of progress can sometimes emerge as subtler <laughs> forms of oppression, subtler forms of oppression. It's very trendy to lambaste what are called Enlightenment ideas of progress without knowing that not one of the great Enlightenment thinkers thought progress was inevitable. That was Hegel and Marx, <clears throat> and we know that they were wrong, at least about that. They simply argued that progress is possible, a very radical notion at a time when most thought there would only be progress in human history at all, if at all, with the coming or second coming of a messiah. Without discussing that history in detail, one thing should be perfectly clear. Without examples of brave men and women who work together to make progress towards justice, we will never have the will to make more. We will also forget to honor those who fought and sometimes died for it. Those who fail to heed past histories of progress are doomed to cynicism or resignation. Portraying all of American history as an engine of white supremacy, or all of German history as irrevocably, irretrievably poisoned by anti-Semitism is bound to provoke backlash, and it already has. But even if it didn't, it wouldn't be true. And isn't the demand for historical reckoning itself a demand for truth? The ubiquity of German guilt for its past crimes makes the country vulnerable to all kinds of manipulation, and its second great error came in 2019. Inspired by Steve Bannon, with whom leaders of the AfD meet regularly, the radical right took over a strategy now common to right-wing parties from Dallas to Delhi. Racism towards other groups can be made to seem acceptable by denouncing anti-Semitism and swearing support for any government of Israel. After all, anyone who does that can't be a Nazi, right? So with a set of dangerous revolutions, the AfD, like uh, India's BJP and many other right-wing parties, supports everything done by the Israeli government while being extraordinarily racist towards many others. What's disappeared in Germany is the memory of the great universalist tradition in Judaism, as old as the book of Exodus, which reminds Jews that we too were strangers in Egypt, hence bound to stand together with other minorities. The German Jews, from Moses Mendelssohn to Albert Einstein, so often invoked on ceremonial occasions, all belong to that tradition. But in the fever currently shaking Germany, Atoning for the Holocaust means supporting Jewish nationalism and detaching the fight against anti-Semitism from the fight against racism. Indeed, in the last year or so in Germany, both the media and politicians of every party have begun to suggest a narrative that opposes fighting anti-Semitism to fighting other forms of racism. It's a twisted story that I can explain to anyone who's interested later. But the unspoken, but very present narrative, like a drumbeat, is the following. People of color equal anti-colonialists, equal post-colonial theorists, equal support for BDS, equals anti-Semitism. Now I would question every single equation in that narrative, but it's humming in German cultural politics, and three days ago, it led to the cancellation of an exhibit in one of Berlin's largest museums commemorating the anniversary of the Bandung Conference, the first large meeting of newly decolonialized African and Asian states in 1955. Since the uh, Springer Press, the country's largest and most right-wing media concern, and the official body that represents German Jews, have both been clamoring in harmony for the resignation of the federal cultural minister, 
but she's allegedly too friendly to the global south and sufficiently <coughs> dedicated to fighting anti-Semitism. Everyone in the culture industry is frightened. No wonder the director of the museum backtracked on his original support for freedom of speech and art and canceled the exhibition until, according to the official um, text, until such time as the mood is less fraught. Probably means forever. A deep sense of guilt leads Germans to focus on the one thing they all know about Jews, namely, we murdered them. This leads them to view Jews as monolithic victims. Now, most white Germans know more about black culture and simply know more black people than Germans know about Jews, but American schools and American social lives are still pretty segregated, and this sometimes leads to viewing African Americans as if they all spoke with <coughs> one voice, uh, eternally focused on racism, just as most Germans are surprised to hear that there is no one Jewish voice eternally focused on anti-Semitism. More than half of Germany's Jews are not members of and hence not represented by Germany's official Jewish council, which is somewhere to the right of APAC. In both cases, many African Americans, people of color in general, uh, and Jewish American, Jewish Germans resent being treated as victims in need of eternal protection. So guilt plays a big role in the seven problems, but I think we're also faced with a structural problem in both cases. Grassroots groups rightly insist that countries face up to their racist past, whose unexamined roots ensure that racist policies persist to this day. And what we want when we do this is to change national consciousness. And when we are largely successful, we want a change in national consciousness to lead to changes in government policy. But government policies are government policies. They're not sensitive to new ones. And they run the danger of making decisions based, if not exactly on algorithms, and on other kinds of formulas that easily become ossified and automatic. This is what happened to the state doctrine of um, anti-fascism in the GDR. Now, I'll close by saying that there are many things others can learn from the Germans, but the one that concerns me most in this moment is whether we can learn from its hysterical reaction to genuine problems. Like Olwyn, I don't think any historical reckoning can be translated from one national context to another. Um, every situation is particular, which is why I think you need a great deal of experience in one memory culture to say anything interesting about it. But I do think we can learn from each other. Um, but, and though I would hesitate to make suggestions to a country in which I'm nothing but a blow in, I did come to this conference after having spent the better or worse part of the last three years of my life fighting uh, the official versions of German memory culture and therefore in a mood to say a plague on memory work. It may be a matter for justice, but is it compatible with peace? And while writing this talk, I was delighted to read a quote by Edna Longley, who I gather was a professor at this university, and who said she thought the next commemoration of Irish history should take the form of raising a monument to amnesia and forgetting where we put it. <laughs> or to read that Conor Cruz O'Brien said that the secret peace negotiations in Dublin in the 80s were ruined because every time they got close to agreeing on something, the Republicans would sing the rising of the moon, or the Unionists would sing the Sash My Father War. Now, those who have suffered or lost loved ones in conflicts are consoled by thinking they didn't die in vain. But let's be honest, nothing will ever entirely console you for the loss of someone you loved. And insisting on the memory of their deaths inevitably means assisting, insisting on the memory of their deaths, perhaps in torture, something only a saint can remember without rage and resentment. If history or anthropology or sociology teach us anything about human beings, 
It's that nuance and ambivalence are in short supply. So is it dangerous to start down the road of historical reckoning in the first place? Shouldn't we all acknowledge that most every tribe suffered and most every tribe sinned and forget this memory work in the name of coming together to pre prevent the planetary catastrophe that threatens us all, no matter whose grandparents did what to whose grandparents? I said at the start that I have very few answers at the moment, so I'll leave you with a conundrum, but a real one. Recently, the most loathsome of all the German anti-Semitism commissioners put out a study calling for the renaming of 290 streets in Berlin on the grounds that they were named for someone who said something anti-Semitic. This included not only Richard Wagner, who was an anti-Semite, although Jewish conductors like David Barenboim insist on performing his music nonetheless. I think Baron Boehm is right not to cancel Wagner, but well, they have an argument about that. When the anti-Semitism commissioner wants to rename Thomas Mannstrasse, I get as annoyed as I do when Americans want to cancel Abraham Lincoln because he wasn't up to uh, today's standards of anti-racism. Mann became an anti-Nazi who emigrated to the US. So I'm sure like, uh, some of the others, German and non-German, he probably made some anti-Semitic remarks. I remember being angry <laughs> on discovering that there's a large Woodrow Wilson Boulevard in Jackson, Mississippi, clearly put there to mark the fact that Wilson, who never went to Mississippi, did everything he could to reverse the modest progress towards desegregation America had made since Reconstruction. At the time, I wondered if it would ever be renamed and thought it should be. But the commissioner's call for renaming in Berlin was starting to make me uh, view any renaming process as a problematic distraction from the questions that really affect people on the ground today. And then on Monday night, after a couple of chaotic flights, I landed in Belfast and looked up to the address of the hotel to give to the taxi driver, and I was shocked. <laughs> Hotels on Cromwell Road? Cromwell Road? I asked the cab driver, this is my first time in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> I asked the cab, he won't say Cromwell Road himself. So. I asked the cab driver about it, who gave me a long discourse on the strangeness of street names in Belfast. Having never been here and wanting to tread gingerly, I said, Well, might some people be uh, upset about that street name? The cab driver shrugged his soldiers, but all that was going through my head was the Pope's version of Young Ned on the Hill. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know it, its chorus begins, A curse upon you, Oliver Cromwell, you raped our motherland, I hope you're burning down in hell, etc. Um, so my recent aversion to the epidemic of renaming suddenly pulled up short. Okay, you needn't rename everything for everyone who ever committed a sin because there aren't enough saints for all the streets in the world. But wasn't naming a street in the middle of Belfast for all the Cromwell pouring fat on a fire that only recently died down. Those of you who are local are better educated than the taxi driver will probably know the last twist of this story. Yesterday we were given an excellent <coughs> tour of the Peace Walls by a very knowledgeable guide. So I asked him about Cromwell Street. Oh, everyone thinks it's named for Oliver, but that's a Tudor district. It's named for Thomas Cromwell. Should one rename it anyway? If everyone thinks it's Oliver, put a plaque under the street name to avoid possible confusion, or forget the whole bloody question, since people in Belfast have other problems? That's only one of the questions I'm unable to answer since I began to think about historical memorialization. Thank you.